Hello, welcome to the Bird Watching Channel. I'm your host, Sharon Sorensen, here to talk about bluebirds. Gotta love them. Bluebirds rank as one of our most coveted yard birds. Year round residents here in southwestern Indiana, bluebirds are said to carry the sky on their backs. And indeed, they're lovely birds. And they sing an ethereal song with both males and females singing. So, who are these bluebirds? Well, they belong to the thrush family. And some of their cousins include gray cheek thrush, veery, wood thrush, hermit thrush, Swainson's thrush and American Robin. But judging by appearances, wow, the bluebird seems not to fit in the thrush family at all. No other cousin is blue. Most other cousins have speckled breasts and most other cousins have eye rings. Ah, but wait, when we look at an immature bluebird, check out the resemblance, yep. Speckled breast, bright eye ring, just like most of its cousins. So regardless of their relatives, what endears me to bluebirds is their seeming care for one another as a family. Bluebirds apparently believe in togetherness. He's devoted to her, shows her around to pick out good real estate, ducking in and out of prospective cavities, working together to make the choice and build the nest. Then, when she's on the nest, he's nearby, feeding her, keeping a watchful, protective eye on things. Later, together, they feed their babies. In winter, they forage in family units, mom, dad, and the last brood of the season, and often roost together inside a cavity, huddling to keep warm. So, how do you attract bluebirds to the yard? Wow, that's no simple question and certainly has no simple answer. Basically, attracting bluebirds begins with understanding their rather demanding habitat. Bluebirds, once nearly extirpated from several states, have rebounded thanks to folks who established and maintained so-called bluebird trails. The trails made up of a couple or a couple of hundred nest boxes were first envisioned in 1977 by Dr. Lawrence Zelaney, founder of the North American Bluebird Society, or NABS, to bring bluebirds back from the brink. And why were bluebirds on the brink? After the introduction in the late 1800s of house sparrows and European starlings, bluebird populations declined by a staggering 90%. You see, native bluebirds find themselves at the losing end of vicious battles with non-native house sparrows and starlings for the same nest cavities. No nest site, no babies. No babies, populations crash. The newly established bluebird trails, however, aided desperate bluebirds by providing those direly needed nest sites. And today, we can continue to offer suitable nest boxes. But not just any nest box will do, and not just any location will be acceptable. So we must follow the NAB's guidelines, and whether you buy or build your own nest boxes, go for sturdy and well-built, preferably of three-quarter inch thick cedar for durability, and constructed with screws, not nails, for tight, waterproof joints. Make sure the boxes have drainage holes, overhanging roofs for weather protection, and ventilation holes at the top and on both sides. 
Choose or build boxes easily opened from front or side for monitoring and maintenance. With a one and a half inch round hole or a one and three eighths by two and one quarter inch oval hole. Hole size is critical to eliminate starlings. Leave boxes unpainted, skip the perches, and if you build your own, check the NAB's website for specifications and building plans. Nest box sites are also critically important. Choose open grassland with nearby high perches, like utility wires or poles or a single nearby tree. Choose locations without large house sparrow populations. Mount boxes on poles, not on trees or fence posts, because both of those just serve as ladders for predators. And mount multiple boxes at least 75 yards apart. Keep surrounding areas mowed. Bluebirds abandon boxes in high weeds. This illustrates a bad box. Bad for several reasons, not just because of unmowed grass. Be sure to use predator guards. There are several suitable styles, and they're absolutely essential to avoid creating snake and raccoon lunch boxes. Monitor boxes weekly eliminating house sparrow nests, ants, wasps, or other pests. Clean out boxes as soon as a brood fledges, and be sure to clean out boxes at the end of the season. Leave boxes up year-round, because bluebirds use nest boxes as winter roost boxes. And speaking of winter, what do you feed bluebirds in winter? Again, no simple question with no simple answer because, in fact, most bluebirds won't come to feeders, although they readily come to moving water. And unless bluebirds are already in your area, no amount or kind of food or water will entice them. Remember, it's all about habitat. So to attract bluebirds, develop their required habitat. In summer, bluebirds eat and feed their babies bugs. Lots and lots of bugs, especially caterpillars, the bug's larval stage. Bluebirds also relish native berries in summer, as do their fledglings. And then in wintertime, with the bugs gone, yep, they're still berry eaters, thriving on native berries. So the best way to feed and attract bluebirds is to plant natives, plants that support insects and plants that produce berries. During severe winters though, when bluebirds face diminished supplies of berries, they can use our help. Then, in desperation, they may be attracted by the activity of other birds in your yard. If other birds are eating, then surely they assume that they too can find something to eat. The traditional go-to bluebird fare, of course, is mealworms, actually beetle caterpillars. Well, they're usually offered live, but some bluebirds do learn to take them dried. However, both nabs and the North American Bluebird Association recommend limiting mealworm offerings even during nesting season. Nestlings need a variety of foods for balanced nutrition. NABA recommends a limit of 10 to 15 mealworms per day per bird in any season. But there are alternatives to mealworms. You can feed something else. Offer options. Let the bluebirds choose. Occasionally, they pick at seed cakes. Not for the seed, most of which they can't eat, but for the gelatin that holds the cake together. 
made from the collagen in bones, gelatin is packed with protein. Bluebirds also take sunflower hearts and chips, but their bill structure doesn't let them crack open whole sunflower seeds. Bluebirds will eat soot, but again, their bill structure doesn't let them hammer into frozen soot. So offering pea-sized soot crumbles works. Since bluebirds swallow foods whole, pea size is max. Chunky peanut butter smeared on tree bark at ground level serves them too. Since bluebirds don't naturally feed clinging to bark, though, they eat more easily at or near ground level. Just a hint that some peanut butter contains lots of oil and sugar, both of which are unhealthy for birds. So check the labels. Some brands have no added sugar. But bluebirds seem to find most attractive finely chopped apples and rehydrated chopped raisins. And again, since bluebirds follow everything whole, pea-sized offerings are a must. The mix imitates their natural preference for berries. For every additional detail you could ever want regarding bluebirds, please go to Cialis.org or nabluebirdsociety.org. Both sites offer exceptionally thorough and accurate information. And then enjoy those bluebirds, those fabulous birds that carry the sky on their backs. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little vignette about bluebirds and how we just gotta love them. If you'd like to know more about bird watching, I hope you'll check out one or more of my books, Birds in the Yard Month by Month, How Birds Behave, or Planting Native to Attract Birds to Your Yard, and that's the book that includes information about planting for bluebirds. You can visit my website, birdsintheyard.com, or join me on Facebook, where I speak almost every day about birds and their habitat. Meanwhile, enjoy the bluebirds, and may you always have birds in your binoculars.